Hi everyone, my name is Molly McCarthy Kunfer. I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish, and I'm happy to be giving you this presentation about how to go king salmon fishing this spring and summer. Before we get started, I do want you to know that this is not going to cover um, regulations for each area. So any information that I'm giving you here, know that you are still expected to check the regulations for the area that you're going to be fishing because things can change through the fishing season. Also be knowing that this is not going to cover how management decisions are made on king salmon stocks, why certain areas are managed differently than others. We're not going to talk about that today either. We are going to talk about simply how to catch king salmon and um, the different ways of doing that in fresh water and salt water. So before we get started, I'll go through a quick outline. We're gonna talk about fishing ethics. We're going to talk about um, just general um, regulation information, how to identify king salmon, how to care for a king salmon once you catch one, and then gear and setups for both fresh water, um, salt water, shore fishing in the salt water, and then some common fishing locations in South Central, Southeast and interior Alaska. So the first thing we always like to cover um, is how to be a good angler, how to be a respectable person out in the environment um, and interacting with fellow anglers. So one of the biggest things is to make sure that you're cleaning up after yourself. There are always people um, leaving trash on the banks of river systems and this isn't a good way to you know have a good name for our user base so everybody clean up after yourself try to be respectful if you know you're going to generate trash like if you're using rubber gloves when you're dealing with bait or you know line gets tangled just bring a small bag to put all of that trash in and then dump it in the trash barrel on your way out following all rules and regulations is obviously a really good way of being an ethical angler the rules and regulations are in place so that you can keep fishing. If there weren't rules and regulations, likely uh, we wouldn't have as good of an opportunity to harvest, especially king salmon um, right now. So respect the rules and regulations. In turn, you're respecting the resource and ensuring that you will continue to get to harvest that resource. Respect private property. Some really good fishing locations are a couple miles down river and if you think you're going to walk the riverbank down to that location you might be crossing private property so make sure that you get verbal or written permission from that property owner before you're crossing onto their private property make sure that you respect the fish even if you're not planning on keeping a fish you should still plan on releasing that in a really um, nice and respectful way and we'll talk about that um, in the next slide so practice good catch and release, me release methods is a really good way to respect the fish. So we'll dig a little bit deeper into that. So if you're gonna plan on catch and release fishing, which some king salmon fisheries are catch and release only this year. If you're planning on catching and releasing, um, you can start with gear that will help you take care of that fish a little bit better, which is using single barbless hooks. So if you're in an area that you think you might hook into something that you want to release, use a barbless hook. It's easier to remove from that fish. So if you catch a fish, bring it in quickly. Remove the fish from the water as little as possible. That being said, in some areas for catch and release, if you're looking at the bottom of the slide, king salmon cannot be removed from the water. So when I say remove the fish from the water as little as possible, I'm thinking you hook into a pink salmon that you don't want to keep and you're gonna take it out of the water to get the hook out, but kings, you need to keep that fish in the water. So good rule of thumb, try to keep the fish in the water as best as you can if you're planning on releasing it. Remove the hook out of the same hole it came in and be prepared to move it quick, remove it quickly. Be gentle with the fish. Use wet hands when you're handling the fish, so it's nice to dunk your hands in the water before you're interacting with that fish. We understand that you wanna get a quick picture. Some people, Catching a king salmon is a huge bucket list item. And if you're planning on releasing that fish, you, you are still going to be able to get a photo, even with that fish still in the water, um, of you holding that fish in a way. So just make sure that you're using wet hands when you're handling it. Don't squeeze or stretch the fish. And don't touch the gills or the eyes. These are sensitive areas on the fish. 
to help revive the fish if, if you know, even though you're trying to bring it in quickly, it might, it might have just been a while to bring that fish in. Um, face, the, face the fish into the current and gently move it back and forth. And you'll notice when you start doing this that this fish will just start kind of swimming and it will swim right from your hands. And when I say this, this means you're holding that tail, that caudal peduncle area, which is that narrow area right before the tail. That's where you want to be holding on to the fish. And then right under the belly. That will, um, those are areas on the fish that won't harm them as much, and that will allow that fish to swim away and revive. And that's usually how folks hold king salmon if they need to it to remain in the water to get a photo. They'll hold that caudal peduncle in the belly. They'll keep that fish in the water. They'll kneel down right next to that fish and get their, get their photo for that bucket list king salmon. That being said, if you're in an area where you can keep a fish, and you've hooked it and the fish is bleeding from the gills um, or it's swallowed the hook, if it's legal, you should probably keep that fish out um, of respect for the fish, um, call it good for the day because um, you know that fish has been, has been damaged. If you're noticing that you're continuing to catch fish that you know everyone you catch, it's hooked really deeply, um, you should rethink your strategy. Maybe you're not paying enough attention. Say you have a rod out with a plug on it and you're looking at your phone and scrolling through Facebook and then you look up and there's a fish on. Um, maybe you need to play, play, pay closer attention um, to what you're doing um, when you're fishing. So just, just think through those things. If you keep noticing things are happening and man, every single time I seem to have that fish hooked really deeply, Think about what you can do to, um, to not have that happen as often as you're going. So how to keep your kids and you safe while fishing. We surely hope that some of you are going to get your kids out fishing too and share that joy and that fun of getting out in nature and interacting with nature. I'm also going to say that I'm aware that this is not a king salmon in the photo. This is a sockeye, but I really love this photo because um, this kid has all of the gear on that I would love seeing on our young anglers when they're fishing in a river system. So kids under 13 must wear a life jacket when they're on an open boat on the deck of a boat or when they're water skiing or tubing. That being said, if there's any doubt that your kid, if they fall in, they're not gonna get out of the water, you should probably put a life jacket on them. And that goes for you as well. There are some, some areas on the Kenai River where I see adults wearing life jackets and good for them because they know that if they fall in, they're not going to be able to get to shore. And by having that life jacket on, they're um, buying themselves some time for someone to help them out. So I encourage you and your kids to be wearing life jackets when you're out fishing. Uh, be prepared for wildlife as well. Uh, we live in Alaska. There's bears and moose around. And especially if you're in a very good fishing spot, uh, bears know where the salmon are. So they're going to be around in those fishing areas. Eye protection is a really good thing to be wearing when you're out fishing, even if you're just by yourself, but especially if you're in areas where there are a lot of people out on the water. Uh, you, with hooks flying, with split shots, I've gotten whacked in the middle of the head with a split shot. You wanna protect those eyes. So sunglasses or like this kid's wearing clear, nice clear glasses that you can just protect those eyes. I can't even imagine what it would be like to get a hook in my eye, and frankly, I never wanna find out, so I will always be wearing <laughs> eye protection. Um, in heavily fished areas, um, or in general, wear closed-toed shoes. You, uh, there's people dropping gear that they might not notice that they dropped, so there's hooks and tackle lying around. There's, um, you know, you don't wanna find one with a bare foot. I'm saying this because I see a lot of adults and kids wearing flip-flops. I've seen kids walking barefoot in really highly trafficked fishing areas. And I always worry about um, if they step on a rusty hook while they're out there. So protect your feet, protect your eyes, um, wear clothes to shoes and wear some safety glasses. So some general license information about king salmon fishing and just about um, sport fishing in general in Alaska. All anglers must have a valid sport fishing license to fish in Alaska. For residents, that means a $29 annual fee with a $10 king salmon stamp fee. So that's $39 for your pass to go fishing all summer and winter 
all year, which is pretty awesome. And it's a screaming deal in my opinion. If you were to buy a whole, one whole king salmon from the grocery store, it would cost more than $39. So just food for thought there. And that's just one king salmon, never mind all the sockeye that you can keep as a resident um, and other great species that we have here in Alaska. For a non-resident, um, you can see all the prices for a non-resident. My parents usually come up and visit every summer, they're non-residents. So by the time that they buy their annual license and their annual king salmon stamp, for both of them, they've contributed $500 towards helping Alaska pay for managing their fishing resources. So uh, non-residents are a pretty, um, pretty important resource for us to effectively manage our fisheries. So um, in, in considering that still, um, for the opportunity to bring a lot of fresh salmon home, the license is worth the cost. So talking a little bit more about these king salmon stamps. Anyone who plans to fish for king salmon needs a king salmon stamp, but there are always exceptions. Those who hold a permanent ID, so those folks over 60 who've gone through the process to get their PID card, or a disabled veteran's, um, card, resident anglers under the age of 18 or non-resident anglers under the age of 16 do not need a King Salmon stamp, nor do folks who have a low income license or residents who hold a license for the blind. So those people do not need to pay for a King Salmon stamp. That being said, you still need to record your King Salmon harvest in areas where you have to record it. And I'll show what that looks like on the next slide. Anglers who do not, so that being said, if you're fishing for the king salmon that are returning from the ocean to river systems or lagoons, you need a king stamp. If you are planning on fishing a landlocked water body like Sand Lake and going out ice fishing and you are going to be catching landlocked king salmon that the hatchery stocked, you do not need a king stamp for that. So just know the difference in that I would recommend if you're going out fishing, you're gonna be pretty disappointed if you hook into a king salmon and you don't have a king stamp and you can't keep it. Um, this happened to my dad last summer at the Nick Dudiak Fishing Lagoon in Homer. We were there towards the end of July, seemingly past the time when king salmon would be returning into that lagoon. And he hooked into a nice big king, reeled it in and he had to let it go because he didn't have his king salmon stamp. So just be thinking about those opportunities. You know, if you hook into a king, are you going to want to release it? If your answer is no, you should probably get a king stamp, but make sure it's legal to keep that king in the system. You're, you're fishing. So when I was talking about recording your catch, you can record your catch on the front of your annual fishing license if you've purchased one. And you can see mine in the upper left-hand corner it says water, species, and date, so you want to have a pen with you. I have had some scrambling to try to find a pen, so put that in your uh, fishing bag when, you, when you're getting it packed up or in your tackle box. If you didn't have to purchase a king stamp, you still should have the Sport Fishing Harvest Record card, which you can download off of the Fishing Game website, and you are still re required and expected to record your king salmon harvest. So. Even if you don't have to buy a stamp, you still need to do this because if a trooper um, sees you catch a king salmon and then you walk back to your truck and they walk up to you and say, hey, nice king, can I see um, that you recorded that king on your harvest card and you say, well, I have a permanent license, that's not going to help you. You still need to re record that fish. So just be mindful of that when you're out fishing. So some areas have seasonal limits and that's where that harvest card comes in and you'll know which areas that you have to record those in because it's on the front of your fishing license and you can look that information up in the regulations books as well. Here's a photo of all of our regulations books. I'm using these photos to say it is your responsibility to get this book and understand what those regulations are before you go out king fishing or fishing for anything in any area. You also need to be mindful of emergency orders. This is a tool that the department uses to either restrict or liberalize fishing regulations throughout the summer. So we're not always going to be closing fisheries. We might be opening additional opportunities. But you need to be aware of these emergency orders as they come out because they might change 
the fishing regulations in the area that you're planning on fishing. So make sure that you're well aware of these emergency orders as you're out on the water. It should be noted too that Southeast Alaska, the King Salmon Sport Fishing Allocation is determined via a treaty with Canada. So most regulations are released in emergency orders. So you need to really be looking at these in Southeast to even know when it's open and what's open. That being said, we know that this is a lot, right? Getting to know this red book, just reading through it is challenging. And then on top of that, you need to be always watching for these emergency orders. We understand that this is a challenge. So we can help you if you sign up for notifications. If you go to the Fishing Game website, you have an option to sign up for Gov Delivery uh, notifications. And there's a nice little pop-up that comes up that says subscribe now. If you subscribe, you can subscribe for daily or weekly reports for the areas in which you choose. And we will send you any emergency orders as they come out so that you're not constantly having to look at the website. You'll know that we will be sending you an email if anything changes in the areas that you selected to learn about. So that's a really good option for sport anglers in the summer. I use that, it's a great tool. We also send out fishing reports on that and a monthly real times article about different fishing areas and recipes. So it's good to subscribe to that if you haven't already. So a little bit about king salmon biology. Uh, king salmon are our longest lived salmon and that is why they are the largest. They spend one to two years in freshwater rearing. So the eggs are laid in a gravel nest in the freshwater. Those fish hatch the following spring and then they spend another year to two years growing in that water body. They then migrate to the ocean during their smolt stage. So that's when their body transforms from looking like and blending in with a freshwater environment to not only looking like a fish in the ocean, but being able to handle that transition from freshwater to saltwater. So there are a lot of physiological changes that happen as well with those fish. They stay in the ocean for anywhere from one to six years. So a king salmon that weighs 15 to 20 pounds probably spent two to three years probably two years in the ocean. A king salmon that weighs 50 to 60 pounds probably spent at least four or five years at sea. So you can kind of guess, based on the size of your fish, how long it was out in the ocean. Adults then return to their home rivers in the summer. A lot of king salmon spawning, at least around the Anchorage area, happens in July, end of July. And then they all die after they spawn. Female king salmon, before while they're spawning, they can lay well over 10,000 eggs. And the really cool thing about kings, they're usually the first salmon species to spawn in systems, at least in South Central Alaska, they are. As the biggest species, they can, the female king salmon can dig the deepest reds or nests to lay their eggs in. So since they're large, they have a larger tail than all the smaller salmon species. So they can dig a nice deep nest, lay their eggs, cover that up, and then when pink salmon or sockeye salmon come into the same system later, they might choose the exact same spot to lay their eggs, but those fish are going to have a shallower nest. So the king salmon eggs are down here. There's gravel on top, and then the sockeye or the pink eggs right, might be right here. So it's a really cool tool to ensure survival of those eggs when they're the first ones to the spawning grounds and there are other salmon that are likely going to pick similar good spawning sites and locations to lay their eggs. And then the largest uh, sport caught king salmon record is from the Kenai River, 97 pounds, four ounces, and that was in 1985. I'll give you a size reference. Um, this photo is of my mom. Sorry, mom, if you ever watch this, you're probably cursing me for putting your picture on it, but it's a great picture. It's a nice fish, so anyways. She caught this king salmon from Chip Creek in Anchorage, and this king was 22 pounds. So 22 pounds, that looks like a pretty big fish. I can't, 97 pounds, four ounces. Um, that is incredible. That is uh, basically four times this fish. So that's a pretty big fish. How do you know if you have a king salmon? Uh, all of our kids in Alaska schools learn this really cool trick using their hands to learn their five salmon species. So if you don't know your five salmon species, this is a really good thing to go through. Even as adults, even if you don't have kids, you should, I don't have kids and I know it. So you can too. So pinky stands for a pink salmon. 
Uh, your ring finger may have silver on it, so it stands for a silver or a coho salmon. Your middle finger is the tallest of all fingers, and the biggest, it is your king finger. Uh, your pointer finger, if you were going to poke yourself in the eye, it would likely be with this finger, so that's your sock eye. And then your thumb is your chum, so that's how you can remember your five salmon with your hand. Now, here's the next level of this. If you put your chum, thumb, and your sock eye together, you get zero spots. Those two species do not have spots. So that will help you get a little bit further down. Now, since we're talking about kings specifically, usually the first, the way I go through this is, does the fish have spots or not? Yes, it has spots. Okay. The next thing I look at, does the fish have a dark black mouth? So I'm going to move along. Here's a picture of all five species. Looking at that king, look at the mouth. There's the spot, the three with spots underneath the king. That king looks like it was painted, had its whole mouth painted with black paint. The pink and the coho have silver and white lining around their mouths. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. You can see that pink salmon and that coho silver salmon, they've got a little bit of silver and white around the mouth where the king is black, the tongue is black, everything is black around that mouth. So does it have spots or not? Yes, it has spots. Is its mouth black? Yes, you've got it yourself, King Salmon. That's how I remember. That's the easiest way to remember. And you can re-reference that first slide I showed you where it went through a flow chart of how to tell each species. That will be really helpful when you're out on the water this summer. And then just to show you as well, these fish, once they hit fresh water, they start to change rapidly from that fresh or chrome look, which means fresh from the ocean, great to eat, they start to turn into their spawning colors, which is literally their body starting to deteriorate because they're putting all of their energy into gonad production, egg production or sperm production for males. They're using all of that energy to do that. They're pulling all of the nutrients from their body and their color is starting to change. So, when you see a salmon that looks like these in the photos, um, I probably myself wouldn't take that as table fare. I would likely let that fish go. However, there's kind of that in-between stage when they're not chrome, but they're not looking like fire engines yet. They're kind of a little bit blush. Um, I, some folks still eat them when they're blush. I, I will still eat them when they're just a little bit blush. I think it's kind of a personal preference thing of how far they are along into that change. And we'll show you a photo a little bit later in this PowerPoint of a, a king knot's blush that people did keep because some of these areas where people are fishing for kings, I mean, these fish have traveled hundreds of miles, so they're not going to ever be fresh and bright and covered in sea lice because they've traveled three to 400 miles in freshwater already. So if you're going to turn your nose to a fish that has a little bit of color to it in some of these interior systems, you're not going to ever keep anything. So just be thinking about that while you're out fishing. <clears throat> some other species that you might catch in especially shore locations are uh, Dolly Varden or Steelhead. These are anadromous, meaning they Step, they start their lives in freshwater, go out to the ocean and come back. These are anadromous um, other species. So Dolly Varden are very similar to Arctic char. They, uh, Dolly Varden are just seagoing char. So they go out to the ocean and come back. A way to tell that you have a Dolly Varden is that it has white spots. All salmon and trout have black spots. All char have lighter colored spots. So lake trout are members of the char family because they have light colored spots. Same with brook trout, they're members of the char family. Um, steelhead are part of that salmon and trout family. They have those dark spots on the light body. Steelhead, you can see, still have that pinkish hue to them, but a really good way of telling that you have a steelhead is one, it has spots all over the tail. So you can look at the tail and it's like, okay, it has spots all over the tail. It's either a king, a pink, or a steelhead. Does it have a black mouth? No. Okay. 
are the spots small or are they bigger and ovally? Pink salmon have really oval shaped spots on their tail. Steelhead have small little circular spots and steelhead also have a flatter tail with less of a fork. So just be looking for those things while you're out fishing um, salt water. But I think that you would have a pretty easy time telling the difference um, if you caught a steelhead, but I just wanna bring these to your attention. So caring for your catch. If the hardest part is catching the fish. Uh, once you've done that, you better do a good job uh, taking care of that fish so that you can enjoy eating it. Um, what's the point of catching it and keeping it if you're not gonna do a good job with, uh, with caring for it? So when you catch a fish, the first, the best thing to do is to kill that fish quickly. One swift bonk on that, on the head is a good way to kill the fish. I see people hitting the fish like 20 times with a baseball bat. Um, this isn't your personal punching bag or way to get out aggression. You're just trying to quickly kill that fish so that it dies fast and doesn't suffer. You're not trying to uh, turn the meat into a uh, burger. So if you do keep whacking that fish, you're actually gonna bruise that meat and damage it. So just be mindful when you're doing that. So give it a swift bonk to the head, gill and bleed the fish. So behind that opercle, which is in the top photo, it's that hard part right here. The gill rakers of the fish are right behind that in the gills. So if you open that up, you'll see these red um, kind of semicircle, those are the gills and the gill rakers. You can either make a cut across those to break them, or sometimes I'll just stick my finger in and pull and break one, and that will get the fish bleeding out. And bleeding the fish is a really good way to get nice clean fillets. So you can see in this bottom photo, those fillets look really clean and nice. If you don't bleed the fish, you're gonna have blood all over those. So you'll know if you forget to bleed the fish because when you cut it open, there will be blood everywhere. Is it the end of the world if you don't bleed your fish? No, but it's just a way to ensure a higher quality product. Uh, then place the fish in a cool area if you're not planning on processing it immediately. I can't emphasize this enough. Treat your fish like you would treat ice cream that you buy from the grocery store. If you would leave ice cream out on a rock for two hours, which I don't think you would, uh, then do the same for your fish. But I don't think anybody in their right mind would leave ice cream out in the sun for two to three hours to just sit there. So don't do that to your fish. If you leave your fish out on the, on the bank in the hot sun, bacteria will start rapidly growing on the fish and the quality of that fish is going to go down. You can actually smell when your fish has gotten too hot. It has a different smell to it. So make sure that you have a cooler and some ice to put that fish on, or you have a stringer to, really, to put it back in the water. Putting it back in the water is a perfectly fine way of keeping it cold, but leaving it on the bank under, you know, under a tree isn't the best way to do it. Also, you should always have your fish connected to you in some way or within arm's reach, because in a lot of systems, bears have figured out that anglers like to leave their fish away from them and have come up with ways to steal them. So keep your fish close by in a cooler on a stringer that's attached to you and keep it cool. Um, the next thing is filleting and processing your catch. The department YouTube channel that you're all on right now has a couple of videos on how to fillet fish. There are also videos on how to smoke can and pickle fish. So we can help you through that process in uh, different videos that we have available. So now for the real, the real part, while you're here, you wanna know how to fish for these king salmon. I put this slide here as a summary. This is kind of your shopping list. I'm gonna break it down a little bit further. So for your rod, reel, and line, your rod power, you want medium heavy to extra heavy, accommodating 20 to 50 pound tests. Do some people use 15 pound tests for kings? Yep. Uh, do some people use a hundred pound test for kings? Yep. So know that everybody does things a little bit differently. I like to use a 20 to 30 pound test for kings. The reason why I do this is because if I hook into a you know 20 pound king and I have 30 pound tests on, I'm going to be able to have a little bit more control over that fish. 
I was using 12 pound test and I hooked into a 25 pound King and it took me over an hour to get it in because I, I could not horse that fish at all or I would have snapped my line. So it was just real when I can let the fish run, real when I can let the fish run. And it took quite a bit of finesse to get that fish in. I was in a tidal area, so it kept running out to the ocean. So if you're fishing with a beginner who might hook into their very first king and they're gonna be tempted to try to really pull it in, don't put 15 pound tests on their rod, put 30 or something that when they do that, cause they're inclined to do it, it's not gonna snap that fish off on them. Um, action for rod moderate to fast action, desirable rod length seven to nine feet. I'm gonna talk a little bit in an upcoming video about picking out your fishing rod, but I like to think of getting your fishing rod as getting a pair of shoes. I'm not going to have my husband go to the store and get my shoes because I like to try my shoes on. I like to go and try out my fishing rod before I get it, uh, especially for women or men that are a little bit shorter or kids. We, I struggle personally a lot finding a fishing rod that fits me correctly. I say this because a lot of fishing rods have these long cork butts to them. So your reel's here and then you've got this rod butt and it's long and clunky. And what I have to do if I have a long fishing rod like that is I have to cast out and then to get comfortable, I have to keep shifting it or it's, I have to hold it out far so it's not jabbing into my stomach the whole time. And it's frustrating. So go to the store and, and move the rod around like you would have to when you're out fishing. Think if you have trees behind you, how are you gonna have to move this? You're already gonna have obstacles at your fishing area. You might as well not have your rod an obstacle before you even start fishing. So I highly recommend if you're thinking about buying someone a fishing rod, just take them to the store and let them find one that feels right for them. A rod that works for me might not be the rod that works for someone else. I'll also, well, I'll talk about in an upcoming video, I'll talk a little bit more about rod length. Reels, just select a reel to balance the rod. If your rod is uh, medium heavy to extra heavy, uh, your reel should accom accommodate that type of fishing rod. So don't put a trout reel on you know an extra heavy rod put an appropriate reel on um, if the rod accommodates 20 pound test the reel should also accommodate such uh, line and i already talked about the line now line types there's monofilament braided and fluorocarbon all of those work fine i would say if you are fishing in a very busy spot and you have beginners with you or you anticipate there are going to be beginners around you uh, monofilament is usually what I go with because if you get tangled with braided line, whew, it is very hard to get untangled. It likes to spin around everything a million, zillion, billion times. So monofilament is kind of my go-to for busier areas where I might get tangled with others. Monofilament's just a little bit easier to deal with. So common bait. For king salmon, where it's legal. So like I said in the beginning, check your regulations before you go fishing. I, uh, I love using bait. That's one of my favorite ways to fish for kings. So what people commonly use, cured eggs, herring, hooligan, and sardines. Those are the most common baits for kings that I could find. I um, almost exclusively use cured eggs because I have access to those because when I go fishing for sockeye or coho in the summer, I save the eggs from all of the females, or if I catch a female king, I save all of the eggs, I put egg cure on them, and then I freeze them, and I have them all ready for the next year. So I'm actually going to grab, I have this giant, giant jar. Um, here are some cured eggs from last year that have been sitting in my freezer. Um, waiting for me to go king fishing this year. So literally just put the skeins of eggs in a Ziploc bag, mix them with cure, which you, if you go to a sporting goods store, you'll find a whole section with cure. Cure is basically to brine the eggs to preserve them. Similar to when you smoke fish, you can put fish in a dry brine or a wet brine. You can brine your eggs in wet cure or dry cure. So experiment 
um, sometimes we, we had this one year where we made a bunch of blue eggs. So there's all different colors. And one day it was like, nobody was getting a bite and the fish were just digging the blue. So try some different colors and, uh, and new things. If the fish have been seeing bait for quite a while and all of it looks the same, you know, they might want to try something different. So here's that. Another trick when you're dealing with eggs, if these will, once they hit the water, they'll start to come apart. <clears throat> and especially if you're fishing in an area with a lot of current, um, there's a really good likelihood that those eggs are going to just kind of fall apart. But if you get, there's these little squares, you can kind of see. This is the material that they use to, for uh, wedding veils or to poof up wedding dresses. It's called tulle um, or mesh. They're called spawn nets at the store, but it's all the same material. You can either go to a sporting goods store and buy a bunch of these little squares of spawn nets, but if you anticipate that you're going to want to make a lot of these, I would go to your local fabric store and buy it in a roll. Um, it'll be much cheaper in the long run. You're just going to have to cut all of your squares. So, and you can get different colors at the fabric store too, or at the sporting goods store. So here's this. If I were to do this right now, I would put this on a paper towel. And this is a great family activity. If you want to get everybody included, you can make an assembly line. Everybody has a job. One person's job is to lay out the squares. The next person's job is to cut the eggs into small pieces, probably about this big. You can go a little bit bigger for kings and smaller for coho. I do the same thing for both. Plop a chunk of eggs right on here. So one person will cut, one person will place the eggs. And then the next person, once the eggs are on here, you just kind of fold this up into a little purse, kind of make a little ball. And then you can buy this magic thread, it's called, buy the magic thread. It is truly magical. Don't use like sewing thread. I did that my first year and I had to hand tie every single one on and it was miserable. Just buy the magical thread. You're gonna wrap the magic thread around so remember, I would have a glob of eggs in here. Wrap it around a couple times, and then you just pull. And if there were eggs in here, this would probably stay together. So wrap it around, pull, and then you can freeze all of these little egg purses, and then you'll get a few more um, casts in using these than you would um, having to constantly dig in your jar of eggs and put new eggs on. If you don't have cured eggs, that's not the end of the world. This summer especially is a great summer to give some business to some of your local folks that are out on the water. So because our tourism industry um, is obviously not going to be what it normally is. So for Anchorage, if I don't have eggs someday, I will go down to Ship Creek and I'll visit the bait shack because I know that they cure their own eggs and they do a really good job. So I encourage you in whatever area you're fishing, if you don't have eggs, visit, visit your local business, your, your local sports shop, and they'll help you out and they'll be thankful for your business and you'll be thankful because they have great quality um, eggs or herring to, to sell to you. So just check those out if, you, uh, if you're not having eggs to do this with or if you're not wanting to, you can always buy this too. Okay, so the first rig I'm going to talk about for king salmon fishing is a spinning glow rig, and this is for bottom fishing for kings. So what you need, you need, I'm going to dig into my tackle box and show you each of these things. You need a sinker slide. These look a lot different. They're all different kinds, but this is just one of them, and we'll, I'll show you a better photo in a minute. You're going to need a pyramid weight. I use two to four ounces for the area that I fish, but for heavier currents, you're going to need heavier weights. So you don't want to cast this and have this shoot under the gravel because it's so heavy. You want it to just rest on the bottom. So if you're casting and this is sinking down deep into the dirt and the mud um, and everything, you're going to have to put a lighter one on. So here's a pyramid weight. Uh, swivels, you should always have swivels in your tackle box. I say that as I 
only finding snap swivels, but got our swivel. Uh, spin and glow. So here is spin and glow. And that's what the photos are. These hit the bottom and they spin. Then a hook for kings, I use a four out hook. Three or four out is, is what I go with for kings. Um, these have an egg loop knot tied to them. These are for using bait. So if you wanna make sure you have an egg loop knot tied on. That being said, if you're in an area where you can only use a single hook and no bait, I know a lot of people who just fish with the spinning glow and a hook behind it because it's a really good attractant. Um, and then, you know, your bait if you have it. So the next slide will show you a little bit better. If you look at, now this shows a few different things in my tackle box, but if you, I'm gonna refer you to the middle where you see the spinning glow. So what I do is you put your um, sinker slide and your pyramid weight to your main line. This photo shows a snap swivel. I likely would just use a swivel without a snap there, but you can, you can use a snap swivel if you'd like. Then you're gonna put, I usually have 24 to 36 inches, but I'll tie like eight to 10 of these rigs of all different sizes. So I'll do some that are from the swivel to the spin and glow, you know, 15 inches, some that are 18, some that are 24, some that are 36. I'll, t I will just tie, there's those nice little um, tubes that you can put a bunch of your different rigs on and I'll do eight to 10 different spinning glow rigs, all of different lengths, all of different color spinning glows. There have been days that the fish are just biting the black spinning glows. There are other, or attracted, not biting the black spinning glows, but attracted to that color. So try a bunch of different colors. Don't get stuck on pinks and oranges only. Some days it just takes something a little bit different. Same as I mentioned with your bait. So this will help you tie that rig for yourself. And if it doesn't, visit the Fishing Game website. We have a video on how to tie a spinning wheel rig. So we're gonna hop over to this video. I am actually going to try to share it with you right now. And I will talk you through fishing at Ship Creek, which is where I was at for this video. And we'll get this shared for you. And hopefully, I'm just gonna make one more quick adjustment. I wanna make sure that it will play um, computer sound as well. It looks like it will. Here we go. So the first setup I'm gonna show you is a spin and glow setup. This is used very commonly here at Ship Creek in Anchorage, but it's also used in a lot of other freshwater systems in Alaska. I am using a medium to heavy action rod. You can notice it's pretty tall. It's over eight feet tall. I picked this fishing rod out because I like to be able to feel all of the minute details. So the longer and um, the more bendable your rod is, the more you're going to be able to feel. So if you have a child or a beginner out and you are inclined to get them a very short, stiff rod, they're not gonna be able to feel as much. So that's why I picked out this fishing rod for myself. I have a Pen Pursuit 4000 reel on here uh, with 20 pound monofilament. I usually use 20 pound tests on my reels. That way I can use the same reel for king fishing and coho fishing. That being said, you can go up to 30 um, on this reel, no problem. Just follow the directions for the number of yards you should spool on for your reel, depending on what uh, pound test you're using. So for a spinning glow set, up here. Um, from my leading line from my fishing rod, I have what's called a sinker slide on. This slides up and down and I've attached a three ounce pyramid weight to this sinker slide. Um, you don't, you will attach this pyramid weight when you get to your fishing location because otherwise it's going to be dangling around and um, bowing your rod down. You don't need to deal with that until you're right there fishing. So I have my pyramid weight. I then have a swivel right here and I have attached a leader onto that swivel. That leader has a spinning glow attached to it um, with beads and my hook. The spinning glow, when this hits the bottom, the pyramid weight will take it to the bottom. It's gonna sit in the current and this spinning glow is gonna spin in that current. That is your attractant for your salmon. Behind there, I have a four aught hook. That's what I usually use for kings, three or four aught hook. And I've tied an egg loop knot onto this hook. That way my eggs are nice and attached. So once I toss this out, that pyramid weight will find the bottom and this will sit on the bottom. The spinning glow will spin and hopefully the, between the eggs and the spinning glow, a king salmon will be attracted to this rig. So I'm going to cast this out and we're gonna see if we can get a bite here. So when your spinning glow 
is fishing, you want to have a nice tight line. So reel until you have no slack and you want to feel that tight line. You want to feel a little bit of a vibration. Now, right now we're almost at high tide. The water is moving pretty slow. So it's going to be hard to feel a really good spin in that spinning glow. But if, it, if the tide was really starting to come in or if you were fishing a freshwater system that has a good current, you would be able to actually see on this fishing rod the vibration of that spinning glow. If you feel a bump in the spinning glow or if you don't feel it spinning anymore, that's a good time to pull up your rod and set the hook and see if you have a fish or see if you've slid into a rock somewhere and you need to reset it. So as of now, I'm fishing. If I were I'm um, gonna stay here and fish all day. I would sit on a lawn chair or an, on a rock and get comfortable and just hold this fishing rod. So this is a great technique to use for kids who might not wanna be casting all day or readjusting. So this is our spin and glow setup. Let's get on to the next one. Is that good? So I just need to cancel out this video. Okay, here we go. So that's our spin and glow setup. We're going to move on to another setup, and this is a slip bobber setup. So the spinning glow fishes the bottom. The slip bobber fishes can fish closer to the top of the water or in the middle of the water column. You can really adjust this to wherever you feel like fishing. So what do you need for a slip bobber setup? You first need a slip bobber. My tackle box is a little bit tangled, so bear with me here for a moment. So here's my slip bobber right here. A slip bobber also comes with, you can see on this one better, it comes with this little uh, tube with string on it and a couple of beads. This tube with string on it, when you're fishing, you're going to slide this off and slide the string off. So it's kind of like this. This string is basically where your slip bobber is going to stop. So if you're confused as to why that's in the packaging, that's going to help you. And I'll talk about that in the upcoming video. So you're going to need your slip bobber, swivel again, uh, split shots or egg sinkers. You can see in the photo, they use uh, egg sinkers. I like to use split shots because um, I can add or subtract them easily. So I just bring a bunch of split shots with me. I always have split shots around. Um, your four out hook again um, and your bait. So that's your slip bobber setup. There are a couple different ways to do this. The photo, uh, the bobber ringing for fall salmon photo shows one really good way of doing it. So you can see the slip bobber is on the leading line, just like your sinker slide would be for the spinning glow. You've got your egg sinkers still on the leading line and then your swivel and then your hook with your bait. The beauty of this is if you get caught on something or tangled up and your line snaps off, you are going to not lose everything. You are just going to lose that hook. You're still going to have your slip bobber and your uh, egg, egg sinkers. And slip bobbers aren't cheap. Some of the nicer ones are seven bucks for two of them. So you really don't want to be losing those. But I like to uh, live on the edge and I just pre-make these slip bobber rigs. So the photo below shows how I do mine. I just pre-make these. So here's one of them. You can see the hook. I've got the swivel. I like to be able to switch my gear when I get to a, a creek or a river system. I like to look around and see what people around me are using. And if I'm using a slip bobber and I see quite a few fish getting caught on spinners and it seems like the bait bite isn't on, but the fish are like in the hardware, I can just unclip this and clip on a spinner and I don't have to, and it takes 10 seconds. I don't have to completely remove the bobber, the egg sinkers, everything from my leading line and then redo it if I want to switch back. So you can you can decide the way that you want to do it you can try it both ways and see what works for you um, but i'm basically just telling you there are, there are many different ways to do this thing so don't think you're doing it wrong if yours doesn't look exactly like someone next to you so i'm going to um pull up a video here in a moment i just need to find it out of our slideshow for a moment. 
I'm going to pull up this video and share it in just a second. Okay, here we go. Sorry for the delay. All right, so the next setup I'm gonna talk about is a slip bobber setup. You can see on my leading line, I have a slip bobber right here. I have a few beads around it just to protect from any abrasion on the swivels. I have a swivel with my leading line that goes down to my bait that has an egg loop knot tied onto it so I can slide that bait in. You can also see I have a few split shots for weight. This is a one ounce bobber, so I need to make sure there's some weight below it because if not, that bait is just gonna sit on the surface and drift below the bobber. So if you notice that your weight, your bait isn't sinking, you need to add a few more split shots to it. For King Salmon, I like to use a one ounce, three quarter ounce to a one ounce bobber. A little bit of bobber fishing 101. If you cast out into the water and your bobber is already almost underwater, you have too much weight below that bobber. So you need to take a split shot off or remove a little bit of weight. Again, if you notice that your eggs are sitting on the surface, you need to add a little bit more weight. So another nice thing about this slip bobber setup is that I can adjust where I have that bobber based on where the string is. So I just slid this string off of this uh, tube right here and I can actually move my string up and down. Wherever that string sits is going to be where that bobber stops. So right now, if I slide the string to here, I've got this much underneath the water. Since it's really high tide right now here at Ship Creek, I might slide that up and then I'll have a little bit more space to fish. So I'm gonna cast this bobber out and we'll see what happens. One good thing about bobber fishing that you should know is this is a great technique to use, but if everybody around you is using spinners or spinning glows, when you cast that bobber out, you're gonna cast it over everybody else's line and make a giant tangle. So be mindful when you're using the bobber, look around you and see what other people are doing before you commit to this method. So I would highly recommend bringing in your tackle box, a spinning glow setup, a slip bobber setup, and some spinners. That way you're versatile and you can fish however you want to fish. Okay, we're going to head back to the PowerPoint. Just give me a moment to get that adjusted. Okay, so that gives you some more information about using a slip bobber. Another really common piece of tackle is uh, just spinners, and, and flies work great for kings as well. A uh, common tackle, uh, pixie spoons work really well, a half to 17 ounce Kodiak custom fishing tackle, skirt and GI spinners. So I mentioned earlier, this might be a good year for Alaskans to really support their local businesses and local tackle shops because with a uh, downturn in tourism this year, our local fishing guides, fishing companies are really gonna be struggling. So. Uh, Kodiak Custom Fishing Tackle is another Alaska-run business. They uh, are based out of Sylvana, and they make some really good spinners. They also make um, bottom fish jigs, so they might be worth checking out this summer if you haven't already. Uh, Vibrax spinners, those work really well, and then teaspoons. So I'll show you. I just have a couple of spinners right now. I have innumerable spinners in my uh, normal tackle box, but I don't have that with me. So this shows you, uh, this is one of the Kodiak Custom Fishing Tackle uh, skirt spinners. I caught my very first king on this spinner and I was super excited. So um, just spins in the water and it's got these little skirts on them. These hold up pretty well um, too. I've caught, we've caught multiple kings on the same spinner um, and they still have all their paint and work well. You can see this has a treble hook on it. Uh, you can buy these with only single hooks if you're fishing a single hook only area. Um, and some of these pieces of tackle also come with a single hook to put on. So I know that um, when I got this, it came with a single hook. This is one of the Vibrax spinners and you can hear wow. So the, I think that the sound might be really helpful attractant for kings in the color. So those are just a couple that I have in my tackle box that I like to use. 
I am not a uh, fly, f I don't do a lot of fly fishing, I'm just learning. But uh, from what I've heard for flies, egg sucking leeches work well for just about everything from what I'm learning. And then uh, my husband does some fly fishing for kings and he suggested a Dalai Lama, uh, which is the one on the far right on the bottom, and then intruder flies. And I grabbed those two photos from Alaska Fly Fishing Goods website and they're um, a fly shop out of Juneau. But um, again, in supporting your local businesses, hit your local fly shop. They've definitely got what you're looking for for kings and they will probably have far more recommendations than what I recommended. So again, if you're thinking of fishing with maybe a slip bobber, maybe a spinning globe, maybe spinners, and you want to be able to switch easily, a quick way to be ready to do that is this. If you put on your leading line, your sinker slide, but you don't attach any weight to this, you just put it on your leading line. Your sinker slide, fingers aren't grabbing these snaps, so there we go. Put your sinker slide on your leading line and then tie on a snap swivel. You can snap on a spinner and then if you pre-make your spinning glow rigs and your slip bobber rigs that just have a swivel on top, you can snap this on using your snap swivel. So as long as you have a sinker slide and a snap swivel on your leading line, you can switch to anything you want really easily out on the water um, without having to cut your line and redo everything. So that would be my suggestion. Now, if all of this seems a little bit overwhelming, if you're like, oh, there's no way I can get this all figured out, I'm gonna say it again. Our local businesses could use some business this summer Maybe it's the summer to go on a guided fishing trip for Kings and just tell the guide that you, you really want to learn uh, how to do this stuff and go with them the first time, see what you learn, and then start doing it yourself. Um, so there are ways to do it. And then the department YouTube channel has videos on how to tie a spinning glow rig, how to tie a slip bobber rig, so we can help you as well. Okay, so another way of fishing the fresh water a lot of people with boats do this, uh, which is river fishing, back trolling with a plug or a spoon. So this requires a heavier rod reel and line because you're going to be sitting in a heavy current area. Most of the people that back troll, it's a controlled drift down river through a few good fishing holes. So you're not letting the river just whip you through the water. You're either, if you're using a drift boat, you're actively back paddling, or if you're using a boat with a motor, you're using that motor a little bit to help uh, slow down that drift. Your rod's commonly going to be in a rod holder. Uh, you wanna make sure you have at least an eight foot rod. That's because that rod needs to be hanging off the side of the boat. You don't want it to get tangled in your motor. So a long rod, a reel with at least 150 yards of line. If you hook into a king salmon in the Kenai River, um, while you're back trolling, you're gonna want at least 50 pound test on likely. So you're gonna have heavier pound test um, and you're going to want to have a lot of line because that fish is going to go screaming off. So make sure, so once you do that, you've got your correct rod. You tie on a diver to help get that, um, to help get your line down to the bottom. And then a four to foot long leader, and then you're going to snap on that plug. And when you're plug fishing, you can see the tip of your, your rod is going like this because that plug is kind of swimming in the current. Um, and when you, when a fish bites, it'll just, your rod will just crank over. So that's one way that a lot of people up here river fish is this back trolling with a plug. Um, pretty commonly used and people are very successful with it. You can also back troll with a spin and glow as well and bait. So there are multiple different ways of doing these things. Okay, your king salmon saltwater setup from shore. I'm not going to go through this with a fine tooth comb because you're going to use same gear as you would use fresh water. Same rod, same reel, same line. Um, the, the major difference is you're gonna use um, maybe more herring or hoochie squids. You're gonna use things that look a little bit more like what they would be finding in salt water versus fresh water. A lot of people fish with mooching rigs with a herring on them from shore. The, the bigger, um, more different is king salmon saltwater 
fishing from a watercraft. So your rod power is gonna be medium heavy to heavy. You want heavier pound test. Uh, rod length six to nine feet. This is where a lot of people use a level wind reel, also called bait caster uh, or a spinning reel, but level wind is the most common. You can use a level wind reel shore fishing as well, but you need to know, really know how to use it. Get your practice in before you go. You need to make sure your thumb is tight on that line as it's going out because if you let any slack off, you're gonna get a giant bird's nest. So it can be really frustrating if you're trying to learn and people around you are catching fish and you keep casting and getting bird's nests. So, but this is very common in, in watercraft and saltwater. Uh, heavier line, and then this is where the tackle kinds of changes. You're gonna be using things like flashers, divers, banana rates, banana weights, plugs, different spoons, hoochie squids, um, et cetera. And we'll go a little bit deeper into that here. So a really common freshwater or saltwater fishing technique from a boat is mooching. You can also try to do this from shore. What you'll need, a herring four to six inches long is pretty good. A mooching rig, which you can see on the bottom right. And these are sold in sporting goods stores if you don't wanna make one yourself. Uh, with three-aught or in four-aught hooks. Um, and then you're gonna need a cannonball weight or a banana weight. So you can see in these photos, the, those are banana weights, um, but people also use a cannonball weight. If you're using a cannonball weight, you need um, a sinker slide to put that, that cannonball weight on. So to set it up, attach a sinker slide to your leading line and attach a cannonball weight to that or use a banana weight. Um, to that, tie on a four to eight foot leader with your mooching rig at the end. You're gonna cut the herring head off and remove the guts and then attach it to the mooching ring. So looking at the top right hand photo, that's a really common uh, way that a mooching ring looks. Then um, a little suggestion is if you put your herring in a cooler with some salt, that will help brine it and it will be less likely to fall apart. The, there are two really great videos uh, done by a guide business in Southeast Alaska on how to uh, make a mooching rig and how to fish with a mooching rig. And I will put these in the YouTube comments so that you can use those videos as a reference. Another common saltwater fishing technique is trolling. You'll need a downrigger um, if you have one. You don't necessarily need a downrigger to do this, but it's really helpful. And if you're finding yourselves um, wanting to troll for kings often in saltwater, you should probably pick up a downrigger. Uh, troll cut herring, hoochie or other lure, flasher or dodger, swivels, and cannonball weight or banana weight. So on the photo on the right, you can see these, these people are not using a downrigger for the setup. They just have a three-way swivel. They've attached the cannonball sinker to one. They've got their main line going to a dodger. Dodgers move like this in the water. Flashers move a full 360 degrees. So if you're trolling too fast, you'll probably find out because if you're using a dodger, it's going to start going around and around and around, and that's not um, what a dodger is supposed to do. So those are just two different attractants. Um, I know people who use both, so they're both pretty common. Then you've got your line coming down to uh, hoochie or your bait. These two show hoochies. Apparently those are really popular for this type of fishing. And then the photo on the left shows how to rig um, up for trolling with a downrigger. Okay, so I've talked a lot about different techniques. Let's just talk through a few different spots to try. Close to Anchorage, I would really recommend Ship Creek or the Eklutna Tail Race. The Eklutna Tail Race is off of the Old Glen Highway. Fishing tends to be best in the early mornings and late evenings, dawn and dusk. Be mindful that in the summer, that's pretty late and pretty early. There's lots of space on the bank to fish, um, and it's a great place to set up a lawn chair and just sit. Um, fishing a spinning glow rig at the mouth is a really good option, but any of those, the spinning glow, the slip bobber, the spinners, all of these work um, at the Eclipton Tail Race. Be especially bear aware. There are a lot of black bears that frequent that area, so it might be good to bring your bear spray and, and your bug spray. And this is one of the areas that the William Jack Fernandez Sport Fish Hatchery in Anchorage stocks with uh, salmon smolt. So it's a really good spot to go after kings, especially if there are a lot of restrictions. 
this is a spot that will likely remain open. Ship Creek is in downtown Anchorage. This is where I do a lot of my king fishing. You can see it is tidal. So if you're fishing a tidal area, you wanna keep those tides in mind. So what you should do for Ship Creek is plan on fishing three hours before the high tide to three hours after. You can see in those two photos on the top that low tide is really challenging access, it's muddy. High tide is nice and easy access. Um, so I would suggest please don't walk in the mud. Avoid the mud by going around that high tide cycle. If you see a spot that's muddy and no one's in it, there's a reason why they're not there. People get stuck in the mud every year at Ship Creek. If you get stuck, please ask for help. And the best way to get out is instead of pulling your feet, you're gonna wanna dig them out. So just avoid the mud if you can. And wear clothing you, go, you don't care about at Ship Creek. I would say my motto is you can take your clothing out of Ship Creek, but you can't take Ship Creek out of your clothing. So be aware of that. Don't wear nice clothes that you love or shoes. So for the Kenai Peninsula, not just focusing on Anchorage, the Seward Lagoon is a really cool spot. You can't actually fish in the lagoon, but you can fish the mouth of the lagoon. So you can see in this photo on the upper left, um, people are fishing for king salmon there. That's another stocked area from the William Jack Hatchery. So king salmon should be returning there. Um, and you can actually snag these in the salt water in Seward. So that's something some people like to do. The Kenai and Kasilaf rivers are obviously very popular king salmon fishing locations. From boat, you can back troll plug. That's a really common way in those two systems. The Nanilchik River is a good one to check out. Bait under a slip bobber. The area management biologist also suggested um, trying a marabou jig under a slip bobber if uh, bait's not working. And then the Nick Dudiak Fishing Lagoon is a fantastic spot to fish for king salmon and coho salmon using a mooching rig with herring, a slip bobber with eggs or herring, flies. I've seen it all work. But again, keep in mind that tide cycle. It's best around the incoming and outgoing tide. The same goes for Seward. Popular Matsu Valley King fishing spots. Again, I'm gonna say check your eggs, check your eggs, check your eggs. These might not even open this summer to uh, catch and keep. So the Deshka River is a great spot that people go if you have a boat. Uh, slip bobber, spinning glow, back trolling. Those are the methods used. And then the Little Sioux has some really good short access and you can use a slip bobber or a spinning glow there. When thinking about Kachemek Bay, you can catch king salmon year round in Kachemek Bay. You can troll using a downrigger, that does the trick. You'll fish in less than 100 feet of water, typically 15 to 90 feet, and trolling speed usually works between one and a half and two and a half miles per hour. Troll cut herring behind a flasher or hoochies are really popular. And you're gonna wanna troll in that upper one to two thirds of the water column. Some good spots to try, North Bluff Point to Sturisky Creek, but be mindful of those conservation zones for kings. Fair Cove, Point Pagibski, and then in the spring, Whiskey Gulch North using a banana weight or a diver. And you can use a kayak or a Zodiac fishing off of the Crook Inlet beaches. So, that's a good option for somebody that doesn't have an ocean boat but has a saltwater kayak. Thinking about interior Alaska king fishing, I've got a few options for you. The Copper River drainage is a really popular one. The Gulkana River, back trolling from a boat or raft with bait or artificial lures works well. Others fish from shore and use bait on bottom or fly fish with yarn. So really similar techniques across the state for freshwater. The Klutina River is a great one to try as well. As, and the Tunsina River. You can notice this king is a little bit blush. This is pretty common for an interior Alaska king, still great table fare. And the Tanana River drainage, the Chena and the Salter Rivers, cured salmon eggs with those little mesh purses works great. Finally, a few spots in Southeast Alaska and things to know. No freshwater fishing for kings in Southeast, aside from Yakutat and a few hatchery king salmon areas, so you're going to be saltwater fishing in Southeast Alaska. Shore-based anglers cast herring and lures and slowly retrieve to trigger king salmon to bite. Good places to go is where you know kings are gonna be returning. So if there's a hatchery nearby that king salmon are gonna be returning to, that might be a good spot to fish from the shore. For fishing the ocean, uh, you can catch king salmon year round in Southeast, but the best time is May through July. So right now, 
And you can see there are some sizable kings in the southeast. Mooching, again, we talked about that earlier. Mooching and trolling are the two main methods. Do exactly as I talked about earlier. Check out those videos. There are lots of good videos on trolling as well. And you can get um, some really great information on that. But same methods we talked about will get you a king in southeast. And here's a cool video of our staff catching a nice king in southeast. So the first netting job was missed. We've all done that. My trick to net kings is to try to get the, the person reeling the king in to get that king's head to lift just a little bit out of the water. And you're going to position that net right below the head because that king is going to dive. And if you've got your net right there, it's going to dive right into your net. You will have a heck of a time if you're trying to net from above. Don't do that. Get the net in the water so that that fish if they can get that fish to come along, you can scoop up at the fish. So there we go. They've got this really nice big king salmon. Woo, that's gonna be a delicious one. And you can see they're pretty excited. Okay, well now we're at the end of our presentation, but I want you to know that if you need further information, the Department of Fishing Game is here to help always. Visit we Fish AK, our we Fish AK page, which the web links are on the left, or our Fishing Game website, Please call or email the Sport Fish Information Centers for the department. Our staff love talking fishing, so call us. And if you have questions about regulations, call us too and email us. We are happy to help. And then visit our YouTube channel. We have some great how-to videos that will help you get all lined out for the summer's fishing season. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in on this presentation. My name is Molly McCarthy Cunfer. You can email me at molly.mccarthy at alaska.gov gov anytime or give me a ring at 907-444-6030 and I'd be happy to chat with you about king fishing. Have a wonderful day. Good luck fishing.